Terry, I'm with Starting Land Products. I'm a technical representative. Um, I'll be honest with you, this is a little bit of an experiment. Um, putting together a seminar that relates to everybody's tuning ability is going to be a little bit tricky. So I realize that there's probably going to be some advanced tuners here, and there's probably going to be some beginner's tuners, and we'll try to kind of start with the easy stuff and get into the advanced stuff and, and maybe try to make it beneficial for everybody. Uh, before we start, maybe a show of hands or who's a beginning tuner? Okay, maybe an advanced tuner. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to cover a little bit of everything and then when we get close to the end we'll do some question and answer and see if we can't cover a little bit more and then we'll be available at the booth to answer any questions if you want to get even into some deeper stuff or have some hands-on stuff. We've got all the parts down there that we can do a little bit of a demonstration with if we need to. We, I intended to have a table, a bench with all the tools and actually show you guys how to do this, but a week ago I had to have hernia surgery and that kind of put a damper on everything. So we'll, I got as many slides as we could to show you what we're going to do. Um, our subject today is um, basically introduction to clutching and tuning and theory. Um, <clears throat> centrifugal clutches, every snowmobile that's ever had been made has had a centrifugal clutch. That's how they transfer the power from the engine to the track. Obviously, if the engine's running, there's got to be something to keep the power from, from transferring automatically, and so the centrifugal clutch is what we use to do that. Three basic components, the drive clutch, or some people call it the primary clutch, the driven clutch, some people call it the secondary clutch, and then the belt, which goes between the two. Um, the primary clutch of the drive clutch controls the engine speed and all shift ratios. It consists of the stationary sheave, which is closest to the engine. It's mounted to a hard mounted to a shaft that is, that is not removable off of the shaft. A movable sheave, which floats on the shaft. A spider assembly, a spring, three or four cam arms, and a cover. So the cam arms are the weights. Articat is the only one that's used a four cam production system. Everybody else has pretty much used a three cam system. The spring mounts between the spider and the cap and that's what holds pressure on the movable sheave against the belt. So as the movable sheave comes out, the spring is what's holding that against the belt. Uh, it's mounted directly to the crankshaft. The clutch is spinning any time the motor is running. So there's got to be enough tolerance between the two sheaves of the clutch and the belt to keep that clutch from grabbing the belt at an idle. And we're going to talk about the importance of that a little bit later. Uh, it opens sideways or axially, meaning it's mounted on an axle and shifts axially on the axle. And of course the spring holds the sheaves open. So as the centrifugal force begins to try to spin that sheave out, the spring puts the pressure that holds that sheave together. Um, it's referred to as a flyaway centrifugal clutch mainly because of the cams or the waves. The benefits, excellent throttle response and back shift. They are very quick. Uh, the spring even makes them quicker. It, I don't know if you've ever felt uh, one with a broken spring, they, they kind of get, get a dead feeling to them. So that, the combination of the centrifugal force and the spring makes them extremely quick to respond. Uh, they're very tunable. Pretty much endless tuning options from spring pressures to radiuses of diameters of clutches to uh, the amount of weight that you try to use to slow the engine speed down or load the motor. Those combinations of spring versus weight versus diameter, it's, just, it's pretty much endless. The disadvantages, movable, moving parts, wear items. Uh, Honestly, when people call me with questions on, on clutch tuning, a lot of times it comes back to a wore out part or an improperly, you know, improper installation. Uh, they want to tune the clutch, but in reality what they need to do is, is get their clutch working properly because some part is not right. Um, the, in, the primary spring controls basically two things. The initial preload, which is your engagement. So what RPM it engages at, that's the, that's the primary controlling factor is, is the initial, uh, initial engagement rate. And then you've got your end compression or your final shift RPM. So your peak RPM in general is controlled by the final compression rate of the spring. So for example, Polaris, Articat, and Skidoo all use a similar system. Um, initial rate of, let's give you an example of say 120, 120 pounds, that's measured at a given distance or a given height. Um, Polaris measures it at 2.5 inches, Articat's like 2 and 9 sixteenths, and 
and Bombardier uses a metric, a millimeter height, um, and it's usually like 60 or 70 mil. I don't remember exactly what it is. So you, anytime you want to compare springs, you, you can a lot of times you can use a cat spring in a Polaris or vice versa if you can understand the rate at which they're measuring that, the height at which they're measuring that rate, and convert it over to what Articat would do. Now on our springs, when we the springs we sell, we use the Polaris method, but I've gone and I've measured them all using Cat's method as well, so that I can say, all right, this this spring is equivalent to, you know, Polaris's almond red, but at the same time it's equivalent to Articat's uh, white yellow. Okay, does that make sense? It's not as easy to convert them over to Skidoo because Skidoo uses much stiffer springs than Articat and Polaris does in, in general. But the, the, the same theory applies. Um, then the way they get the final rate is the same way. They compress that spring down to basically spring spring bind, which you know, it, it can't it can't compress anymore. Uh, and that's the second rate. So that is usually about an inch and a quarter. I think Polaris goes 1.19 inches, and Articat's like 1.25 or something like that. Now the other factors contributing to RPM and the primary clutch is the cam arm or the weight. It does have an effect on engagement RPM. The heavier the, or the more mass that's on the weight, the lower the engagement's going to be. Um, it also affects the shift rate because the curve of the weight, and I can show you, there's different curves. You can buy all kinds of different cam arms or weights that have a different radius, uh, different pin position versus where the radius starts, and also the hill right here versus the pin. Every one of these usually has a little bit different hill height as far as right here versus that pin versus where the roller is going to sit right here. And that all affects where the engagement is going to start. So that in com combination with the primary spring initial rate is going to control where that sled is going to engage. Um, same effect with the final shift rate or peak RPM, only that's going to be more out here on the tip and it has much less to do with the hill height and the pin position, more of the angle of the tip or the radius of the tip. So that's your peak RPM. The shift rate would be basically the speed that the weight allows the roller to shift from the hill to the tip. Okay, and the mid, the spring, let's say you have a spring that's a 120 340 compared to a spring that's a 160 340. That changes the entire mid-range of the spring. If you try to graph that out on the graph, let's say you put uh, you put all of your, your low numbers here and your high numbers here, and you change that number, it's going to change the whole shift force across the mid-range. It's going to raise the whole force up or down. Is that, are you following me? Does that make sense? And so just by changing your engagement, not only are you going to change your engagement where, your, where this machine starts to move, but you're also changing the whole mid-range, and the, and the closer you get to peak shift, the less, the less effect it's going to have. Or vice versa, if you change your final number, say your 340, you drop it down to a 310, it's still going to have an effect on the mid-range as well, but it's going to have less effect on the initial engagement. That, that makes sense so far? Okay. Okay, so the secondary clutch uh, provides side pressure on the belt to allow power to be transmitted properly. So. The, the, the secondary clutch has two contributing factors. What the primary clutch is doing, so as soon as the primary clutch begins to shift and that belt begins tight, that's going to put pressure on the secondary clutch to start turning. So that's one con contributing factor. The second contributing factor is the drag from the track. So there's, uh, there's natural resistance from a standstill, and that resistance is going to try to keep the belt or the clutch from twisting, and that's what gives give you some of your side pressure. Um, the secondary effect it has is one of your largest effects on efficiency and backshifting. So backshifting meaning loading the clutch versus unloading and then applying load again. So if you're climbing, you hit a drift, you come up in the air, so you unload the track, and then you come back down and you reload the track. So you're going to go from having a lot of belt pressure to no belt pressure and then back to having belt pressure again. So the way the spring is calibrated versus the helix is going to affect how quickly that clutch can backshift or upshift and keep you in the peak RPM. So that's the whole point of, of staying in the peak RPM, that backshift, how quickly it can get you back to your peak RPM.
The second area consists of a stationary sheave, again mounted to a shaft. It's hard mounted, you can't take it off. Then it's going to have a movable sheave that actually uh, slides on the shaft. A spring, a helix, and a retaining clip to hold the helix down on the shaft. So the, in most cases, it depends on the type of clutch. Some of them the helix actually slides on the shaft where other clutches the helix is stationary and the rollers will slide on the shaft. So something has to, to twist in order to get that movable sheave to, to actually shift on the shaft. Um, the secondary clutch is a huge factor in the shift rate. It, it's actually the main factor in shift rate. Polaris and Articat don't do a lot of rate changes with the cam arm, with the weights. They do most of it with the helix because the helix angles are so much easier to change. Bombardier has, um, they use ramps instead of shift, shift weights and we'll go over that in a little bit. And you can tune, they have lots of different ramp angles that act just like a helix. And you can tune with ramp angle and you can tune with helix. So it gets a little more complicated because there's an additional factor there, okay? But in the secondary, most of your upshift and your back shift characteristics are with the secondary, the spring, and the helix. Uh, again, virtually unlimited tuning options. There's pretty much endless supply of different helixes and springs. If one doesn't exist for what you're trying to do, they can be custom cut. They're all really not that expensive to do. Team, in fact, team will custom cut a helix for like 110 bucks. So for drag, if you're doing some, a one-off drag racing or you know whatever the case may be, you can typically get a helix that'll do what you want it to do. Okay, this is where the tuning kind of starts to come into play. Um, there's, there's, oh, there's basically four or five different types of helixes. Um, well, actually, we'll back up. We're talking about the ang what effects the angle have. The angles provide more belt squeeze. So, like for example, a shallow angle meaning a low number. So helixes could be maybe a, a, a 36 degree, or they could be a 73 degree. Obviously a 73 degree is much steeper than a 36 degree, so you can compare it to say um, a grade if you're climbing a 10% grade versus a 6% grade in a pickup. It's going to take a lot more power and a lower gear to climb a 10% grade than it's going to say a 6% grade or a 3% grade. Same exact idea with helixes. The higher the angle, the more load, the more power it takes to shift that aggressively. Okay. So the shallower the angle, it's going gonna, it's gonna to provide more belt squeeze because there's less resistance from the helix. It's going to result in a slower upshift, meaning uh, you're going to have less load or less squeeze on the belt. Um, you're going to have a stronger and quicker backshift because you're, you're not going to have a, a big angle resisting that clutch coming back to center. So the steeper the angle, the harder it is for the clutch to come back to center or shift to a lower gear, okay? Steeper angles are exactly the opposite. They have less belt squeeze. The, the angle is so steep that the clutch has a hard time getting higher on the angle. So it's, 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 you don't have as much belt squeeze to do that. It usually takes a stiffer spring to maintain that belt squeeze on a big angle. So a general rule of thumb is the more angle you use, the stiffer the spring you're probably going to have to have to maintain that squeeze on the belt. A real easy way to tell if you're losing squeeze on the belt is that secondary is going to get hot. And I have guys call me all the time and they'll say, my secondary clutch is super hot, my primary clutch isn't that hot. Well that's telling you that your secondary is slipping and you're either going to need less helix angle or you're going to need more spring pressure to compensate for that. That's a pretty general rule of thumb when it comes to secondary tuning, okay? Uh, again, steeper angles have quicker upshift, but they also have slower backshift. All right, here's the helix types, and this is kind of where we get into the tuning aspect. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? Barry. <laughs> Depends on the manufacturer. Every manufacturer has a beginning starting point for what angle, where they want to measure their base angles. And that, that actually brings up a really good subject that a lot of guys don't understand as well. You can't compare, and generally you can't compare one manufacturer's angles to the other manufacturer's angles. So one common mistake is you don't want to assume that one manufacturer's angles are exactly the same as another manufacturer's angles because in most cases they're not. 
Um, but again, I wouldn't assume. Either, either talk to somebody who knows or, or figure out a way to measure it. But when you're tuning, you either need to stay with the same manufacturers, helixes, or, or be able to figure out a way to compare in your notes so that you can, you can stay on track with your, with your progress, okay? So good question. So we've got four types of, 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 of helixes. We've got straight angle, just meaning one solid angle, okay? We've got fully progressive, which means you start with one angle, you finish with another angle, and it's just progressively shifting between those two angles for the whole curve. You've got a multi